Good morning. This public meeting of the Investment Committee is being held at 30 North 3rd Street, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. Although being live streamed via the internet, this meeting is a live, in-person meeting open to the public in accordance with the Sunshine Act. The live streaming of this meeting is presented as a convenience and is not provided as the official means for public attendance. In the event the live stream fails or cannot be transmitted for any reason, the in-person public meeting will continue without interruption. Please proceed with your meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I? I have this one. Okay. Am I? okay. Good, hey, morning, everyone. good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Is it still on? It's still on. Okay. We're just going to shut that down. Okay, might have been me, Glenn. Might have been me. Okay, we'll try this again. Good morning, everyone. I'd uh, like to call to order uh, this December 5, 2022 meeting of the Investment Committee of the Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System. Uh, may we have a roll call, please? And uh, Jared Snyder, if you would. Yes, thank you. Chair Becker? Here. Thank you. Senator DeSanto? Senator DeSanto? All right. Or designee for Senator DeSanto? Uh, this is this is Chuck Erdman, designee for Senator DeSanto. I believe the senator is going to be joining, however. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fillman? Present. Thank you. Representative Frankel? Representative Frankel, de or designee? Okay. Treasurer Garrity? I'm here. Thank you. Senator Hughes? Senator Hughes, or designee? Mr. Jordan? Here. Great, thank you. Representative Schimmel? Representative Schimmel or designee? Say it again. Joe Becky, I was here for Representative Schimmel. It is. Thank you. Ms. Soderberg? Here. Thank you. Mr. Thal? Here. Thank you. Secretary Vague? Here. Thank you. Uh, then President, two absent. Great. Thank you, Jared. Um, the uh, first order of business is the approval of the minutes of the September 22 Investment Committee meeting. I move that the minutes uh, be approved as presented. May I have a second, please? Second. 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 Thank you. Uh, we, all in favor, aye. 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 Hearing none, minutes are approved as presented. Uh, there's no old business to review today. Uh, under new business, we have several items. Oh, wait, Joe, did you want to, uh, excuse me, let's go back. Uh, Joe. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Becker. <clears throat> Sitting to my left is Kara O'Donnell. Uh, the normal uh, counsel to the committee, Deputy Chief Counsel Steve Scoff, is on vacation for two weeks. Kara is second in seniority in the uh, business and transactions team in the legal office. She's one of our uh, hot uh, talents that's uh, developing very, very, favorably, and so she will be advising not only this committee uh, for anything, but also on the uh, Finance and Member and Participant Services Committee, along with Kathy Noll on that, that, that committee. So, um, Karen, thank you. Uh, Karen, thank you for sitting in on the uh, meeting today. Great. Thank you, Joe, and welcome, Kara. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good. Let's, we'll move on to uh, new business, and we have several items to cover, as usual. And uh, we have, we'll have CI, uh, updates from our CIO, quarterly performance analysis for the defined benefit, deferred compensation, and defined contribution plans. 
uh, as well as um, uh, the private market portfolios. We have uh, a one private equity opportunity to consider, and uh, we also have uh, some updates on pacing uh, for our private market portfolios. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, the investment office. Now, Jim Nolan, our CIO, is uh, traveling and has uh, run into some pretty significant uh, technical difficulties. Uh, he is uh, listening in. He's in the car and listening in, but we thought uh, with that, given those circumstances, uh, Deputy CIO Bill Tron will step in and uh, lead us through uh, this portion of the meeting. All right. Thank you, Chair Becker. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, board members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the first item for discussion is in uh, Section 5A. And could we go to page three of the page two of the presentation, please? Thank you very much. Uh, since the last board meeting, the investment office, working with Chair Becker as well as Callen, uh, we executed one rebalancing to raise some cash. Uh, we, we redeemed from a U.S. bond fixed income, uh, U.S. bond index strategy, and reallocated the two hundred million dollars to cash. If there are no questions on that, we can proceed to the next item in Section 5B, where Callan will provide a quarterly performance update. Okay. Good morning. This is Tom Shingler from Callan. My video is blocked, so apologies, I'm not able to be on video. So if we could open the the report for the defined benefit plan, I'm going to cover that executive summary. And my colleague, Britt Murdoch, is going to cover the DC and DCP plans. And then we'll be back later with a colleague in defined contribution regarding the structure of the, the DC and DCP plans. So if we could go to slide three, please. Okay. Thank you. So from a markets perspective, it has been a difficult year. We've been talking about this at the meetings throughout the year. The decline in both the equity markets and the bond markets, and that there have been very few areas with positive returns from a diversification standpoint, it has been challenging. The silver lining is that we're looking at performance through the end of September, and if we look at it since then, we've had a rally in equity and bond markets, so returns are not as negative as they were year to date when we look through the end of Friday. So the S&P 500 is down 13%. The Russell 3000, that's the broad U.S. equity benchmark, is down 14 percent, and non-U.S. markets developed and emerging are down 14 percent. And then on the bond side, the Bloomberg aggregate, the broad index there, is down 11 percent. So not to say that we're out of the woods of this bear market necessarily. That said, it is a good reminder to stay invested in the markets. We do not know when they're going to turn. And so I did want to point out that we have had that, that rally since the end of the quarter. And then if we go from there to slide six, please. So these are the, the numbers on the top left, the PDF numbers. Okay. So from, a, from an asset allocation perspective, you do see some small deviations from the from the, the target here. And what we are seeing is the impact of the denominator effect where the private markets, most notably private equity, but also to some extent real estate are being driven up in their percentage of the plan because of the decline in the public markets. So if you look at the, the public market asset classes, U.S. equity, as of the end of the quarter, was underweight slightly, 1.1%. International developed markets were also underweight, 2.4%, and EM equity underweight, 
The overall equity exposure, though, remains uh, right around the target, and that's because of the overweight to private equity. So you can see private equity as of the end of the third quarter, and keep in mind these values are lagged a quarter, but you can see 19.9% versus a target of 16, so 3.9% overweight there. And then when you think about that, that risk posture of the plan, there's that overweight in private equity and the underweight in public equity leading to about an, uh, a, a comparable to target overall weight. There's also the component that's called here legacy private credit. So you may recall that the plan formerly had a dedicated target to, to private credit and, and a separate target to private equity. And these have been combined in the 16% private equity target. There's no longer a separate private credit target. Private credit is embedded in private equity and now, but you do have these, these legacy private credit investments and that's 1.2%. And then slight underweight to fixed income, which now includes the, the opportunistic fixed income component of Blackstone. And then inflation protection, so that would be the TIPS managers and the global linker manager, they're right at target. And then real estate, slightly overweight, 1.7% overweight. Legacy hedge funds, that's 0.1% at this point, and then a slight underweight to cash. And Bill Top Trong did talk about the, the <clears throat> raising of cash. So if we go to the next slide, we're, one way we classify the assets is return seeking asset classes versus capital preservation. And you can see in the bottom of this slide or on board docs, the, how we delineate all these different asset classes that are return seeking versus capital preservation. So there are other ways of looking at asset classes. This is one broad way of looking at the return seeking or the riskier component of the portfolio versus the capital preservation component. So slight overweight as of the end of September to the return seeking assets at 78% versus a target of 75. And then corresponding underweight to capital preservation versus, versus the target. If we go a few slides ahead to slide 10, please. This looks at what happened in the quarter. So we do have all the net of fee returns. This is a gross of free attribution chart that we run. And we're looking at only one quarter here, but we'll go over this briefly and then the one year performance as well. So you can see the performance for the quarter was negative. That's not surprising given the, the, the market declines that we've seen this year. And in the third quarter specifically with the rally since then, as I mentioned earlier. So very close to target performance overall, negative 5.17% versus a target of negative 508. And what drove performance in terms of relative performance, the biggest driver for the quarter was the underperformance of the real estate asset class managers. So real estate underperforming its target. That was the, the largest uh, driver of, of underperformance, although it was marginal in terms of the total fund performance. If we look at the next page, that's showing it for the quarter, excuse me, for the year, and you can see the, the return of the plan, negative 1162 versus negative 1229 for the target. So what drove that outperformance when you think about the, the asset classes. So if you look at US equity there, you can see the, the manager effect was the biggest driver on the negative side. So negative relative performance, but that's really driven by an overweight to small cap, which has since been reduced. So it's not really active managers. There's one active manager left in US equity. So it's really driven more by that structural component of having more in small cap stocks. And then that, uh, that with the last asset allocation was changed. International developed markets being underweight there did benefit the plan, as did the performance of the managers relative to their benchmarks. So the managers outperformed. EM equity being underweight there also helped. And then the active manager performance was under the benchmark. So that detracted. For private equity, the the driver there was the overweight. So you can see for the year, remember that this includes a point where the private equity target was 12% and then it went up to 16 with private credit being folded into it. So being overweight, the asset class in this period did help performance. 
you can see that in the asset allocation effect of 64 basis points. For legacy private credit, it was a, a positive performance from a manager perspective. You can see the managers far outperform the target and then a slight detraction on the, the asset allocation effect. Fixed income managers did uh, outperform there as well and marginal asset allocation effect. The other major asset class from a attribution driver perspective was real estate. So there, the absolute return was strongly positive, 14, 14.11%, but that did significantly lag the benchmark. So that's a detractor from performance versus the target for the managers. And then the overweights, the asset class did help performance. So that's a brief summary of the one year performance. And then in the interest of time, I know we have very little time to cover this and Britt's gonna cover the two DC and DCP plan. So I'm going to cover one more slide. The next slide. This is looking at gross of fee performance versus a gross of fee peer group. And this is our very large public plan group that we typically show. It's about 50 plans that are over 10 billion in assets. And we also show the total fund benchmark as well as a public market broad benchmark. So that's a secondary benchmark to say, what's the opportunity cost of being in a more complex asset allocation? Would be a bit better off simply owning a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. And I'll point out a couple of main points here. One is that we've been in a period where public market returns were very strong. It was difficult for any plan with more diversified asset allocation to beat this type of 60-40 benchmark. If we looked across, types of plans that we work with at Callan, where it was public funds or endowments or corporates. Very difficult to beat this benchmark if you think about how strong the equity markets have been uh, up until this year, generally speaking, since the global financial crisis. Now we see that turning. So you see that the total funds performance is stronger over these periods versus this public market simple benchmark. And generally speaking, uh, the performance has been above its target if we look at these periods and the performance versus peers so for the last year it's below the median in the the third quartile and then if we look at longer periods it's generally in the second or third quartile and all the way up to 20 years in the top quartile so that's a that's a brief summary from a performance perspective we are uh, in a period now where we've Revise the asset allocation. We talked about that with the board in September with the asset liability study. We are making some changes on the fixed income side in particular with the staff. So we're going through the search for core and core plus active fixed income managers and we'll be back to the board next year with more information on that. So potential managers there to, to diversify the fixed income and potentially make changes there to, to the structure. So not, not at the asset allocation level, that was just revised, but at the at this what we call the structure level of the asset class and fixed income. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions or comments. All right, thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, uh, Chair Becker, I'm going to turn it over to Britt Murdoch then. Uh, that's fine, thank you. And we'll go to the, the other plans. Would you like us to cover those or do you want, uh, how do you want to proceed for, in terms of timing? Um, unless there are questions from board members in regards to the executive summary for the DCP plan as well as the DC plan, uh, we can proceed to the private equity uh, update from StepStone. Yep, that's great. So if there are no questions, uh, Mike Elio and Matt Roach, uh, could you guys start on the private equity, private credit quarterly performance update? The section is 5C. Yeah, I, I think what we'll do, Bill, is we'll start with private credit as that one's phasing out and that's uh, more of a post-mortem. So we'll click on that one first and go through that relatively quickly. Um, as you can see in this portfolio, as was mentioned earlier, uh, this is a portfolio that we're phasing out and rolling into the private equity portfolio. But even given that, you can see that the portfolio has managed to do 
fairly well. Uh, over the last year, it's gained about 76 million in value. The last quarter was down about 25 million. Uh, if you go to slide one, there you go. These are some of the key metrics. And if you look at the quarterly change and the annual change, look, private markets don't change dramatically from quarter to quarter. Um, so the annual change really is where you should focus. But as you can see, the unfunded commitment as it trails on is starting to come down as we are no longer um, adding assets or making new commitments uh, specifically in this portfolio and we're rolling into the new portfolio as we go. That said, it's still generating some distributions on the portfolio, um, 60 million in the last quarter alone. So uh, IRR is still 14.8%. Um, so it's holding up well, even given some of the headwinds that we're seeing in the macro environment. Uh, the next slide, slide two, from a benchmark perspective, you can see performance in the one year has done well, 8% versus uh, the public market equivalent of below nine. Um, again, this has to do with not just some of the great managers you've chosen in this particular space, but the fact that you're no longer committing to this space, so you no longer have the J-curve effect of new commitments going in um, and dragging on the overall performance. If you skip ahead to slide five, as I'm trying to do this one quickly so we can focus on PE, the quarterly cash flow activity, you can see that that's starting to trend up as more of the cash is coming off the portfolio and less is being reinvested into your unfunded commitments. This is a trend that you should see continuing. And I think the next slide, slide six, is a better graphic of that. As you can see, uh, less money is going out the door into this portfolio and slowly the money is, is coming back. Um, another example of that is fund eight, slide eight. Um, you can see that uh, as we built the portfolio up through 2019, that's where your unfunded is, and of course, uh, has phased down from there. So unless there are any questions on the private credit, let's focus on PE um, and go through that presentation. And we can go right to slide one. So slide one is the same format that you saw on the private credit portfolio. It is a bit of an eye chart for those looking at it on the screen. Um, but again, the story here, to Tom's point earlier, uh, it has been dark in the macro environment, but PE is exactly um, where you want it to be in this market. Um, we are overweight PE, as he mentioned, but it's because it's been doing well, um, and you can see that here in your numbers. Uh, annual change uh, over the last year, you're still up a billion dollars in value, and what you'll see is it's still generating some pretty meaningful distributions on the portfolio. Again, performance is down by about uh, 10 basis points, um, but not material. Um, and you can see that distributions um, are still 25.8 billion. These are pretty uh, strong numbers. I will say the March to June number, even though um, you've noticed that on a pacing side, we've slowed our pacing in the aggregate, uh, but the portfolio is still doing well. You can see the total market value went from March of 6 billion to 5.6 and a half. Um, that is because of some of the strong distributions that we're seeing on the portfolio. If you go to the next slide, this is really why you're in private market slide two. Uh, the one year number is 2.8 versus the 15 drop in public market equivalent. And you can see whether it's the three, the five, or since inception, this portfolio is performing exactly uh, as, as you want it to. It is diversified, it is large, you have been very consistent at making sure you have your vintage year exposure uh, in, in a reasonable pace. Uh, digging down on some of those performance numbers on slide three, uh, we break up the portfolio uh, into some of the components so that you can see uh, where the portfolio is doing well. I guess since inception, which are the bars on the right, you can see we are just about at our Russell three plus three. 12.6 uh, versus the 13 since inception. But what you can see is in the one year return, uh, we're still doing quite well. Where you see a lag in performance, specifically the Keystone Legacy, um, that is where a lot of your legacy venture is located and no longer core to the portfolio. And you can see that's where the drag is. Um, we determined a number of years ago that that was going to be non-core and not a focus of the portfolio. So its overall drag in the portfolio did not uh, um, cause any uh, overall drag in the performance of the fund itself. 
And again, the numbers, the three, the five, and 10 are substantial. Quarterly movements, um, you can see on slide four, uh, this is where PE, PE may lag in your overall reporting because Tom mentioned 930. Um, but in these particular marks, you can see the gain loss of 374 million really reflects some of the buyout downturn and downdraft that we've seen in the market. Um, so that truly reflects uh, what we've seen from headwinds uh, in the portfolio. Hey, Mike. Other this than is that, Mike. Oh, yes, yeah, so Re Representative Schemmel has his hand up, please. Sure. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I could have waited till the end. Uh, but uh, question, so I've read that uh, the PE tends to lag the market uh, both up and down. So, um, and I've been concerned about our investment in PE for a time. You know, what do you see on a longer term? Do you see the market reacting on PE? Uh, can we expect it to continue this pace? Or do you think that we'll start to see a decline there? And, and, and you know, sort of what do you see in the future? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll whip out my crystal ball. Uh, first, Thanks. I'll take uh, the valuation question and then I'll talk about Outlook. Uh, from the valuation perspective, uh, I will say it's always been uh, just a very good phrase in this, in this industry to say it lags the market. Private equity doesn't lag like it used to ever since uh, FAS 157 came through. So valuations have come through a lot faster um, than they have historically. So I will say in Q1 valuations for buyout were pretty much in denial and markups didn't happen, uh, markdowns didn't happen. In Q2, we saw downdraft go anywhere from four to 8%, uh, depending on the larger end, which is more closely uh, correlated to the public markets, to the small and mid-market buyout, which is a lot less correlated, was more than 4%. You can see your downdraft was significantly less than that at 2.9%. So that's a testament to the diversification within your portfolio. Um, we are not seeing any more uh, headwinds from a valuation perspective in the buyout space. Uh, our, our models show a, a modest 1.5% to 2% downdraft in Q3 uh, with moderation uh, flat to up depending on where you're invested for Q4. Uh, so buyout has taken its lumps. Venture, on the other hand, has not. Uh, venture is it gets all the headlines. That's the, the Facebooks and the you know, the large public tech stocks that everybody reads about, um, those have come down significantly. Um, we're not seeing that in in the buyout space, but we are seeing it in the venture space. Your significant underweight to cash burning companies uh, is helping you in this portfolio sticking to um, more stable, low loss ratio buyout uh, portfolio investments, which effectively really is a replacement to the loss of public market companies that are just no longer public. You're just getting access to them through the private markets. Um, as far as Outlook is concerned, um, venture probably still has a little ways to go, a little less relevant for you, but um, it probably still has a bit of a downdraft ahead of it. Uh, buyout, look, the private markets love dislocation. What better dislocation than what we're having right now? I mean, could one more thing go wrong? I mean, not would, right? We've got war, we've got inflation, we've got interest rates, we've got just a lot of crazy things going on. Um, and this is when companies become available for good prices. So when the bid-ask spread gets wider, that's when private markets uh, with their capital can step in. And if you look at historic dislocations, private markets outperform significantly in those vintage years. So this is this is not the time to go run and hide. It's It's a time to deploy new capital uh, into the space uh, in a measured way. I think you've done a great job historically maintaining vintage year exposure. I think maintaining that consistency is the right thing to do. Now we'll have to measure that, of course, based on the size of your overall portfolio, which has come down. So we have to look at that accordingly. Um, but you can see the private markets percentage has been coming down over time um, because of our proactive um, pacing analysis, which we'll talk about later. So that was a very long answer to a short question, but hopefully that worked. One one quick follow-up. You say vintage vintage year. Did I hear that right? That's a term I don't know. In, in vintage year diversification markets. means you commit consistent amounts year after year. And you don't you don't commit, you know, two billion this year and two hundred million next year. You just kind of stick to your 
800 to a billion and so on per year. Got it. Thanks. Yep. So I guess with that, we'll jump ahead to uh, cash flow activity on slide eight. Um, you can see that deal flow is down, um, but you're still getting some meaningful uh, distributions on the portfolio. Q2 kind of marked the the wait and see period in private markets where deal flow is down about 20 percent. Um, but we're also seeing is an uptick in a lot of secondary deal flow. Um, so the opportunity set is getting larger. If you look at that on the next slide from an annual basis, um, it probably highlights it more. You've been cash flow positive and pulling out um, pretty much 500 to a billion dollars out of this portfolio per year, even as you keep it funded. This is to your self-funding uh, to the point I made earlier, getting uh, self-funding self -funding private markets portfolio, um, and you've done that quite well over time. So with that, um, the rest of the slides are more into the details, but in the efforts of time, maybe I'll pause here and see if there are any other questions. He is doing what it's supposed to. All right, thank you, Mike. Got it. The next topic is under Section 5D with uh, NEPC, SIRS Real Estate Consultant. Matt? Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I'll be reviewing the second quarter of performance for the real estate portfolio and provide a little bit of an update on the portfolio itself as well as the real estate market more broadly. So if we can start on page two here, we've got a quick performance summary. Um, so after an really incredibly strong 2021 with historically high returns, real estate markets began cooling off in the second quarter of 2022 and, and into the second half of uh, second half of the year, which I'll touch on a little bit more at the end of the presentation, try to bring us a little bit more current since this, this information is all as of June 30. Um, the NACREF Odyssey Index, which is the, the benchmark shown here for the service portfolio, um, still managed to generate a 4.5% return for the quarter. Um, but both the non-core real estate and the REIT components of the service portfolio saw a pullback during the quarter. So um, much of that has really been driven by the rising interest rate environment, which again, I'll, I'll touch more on in a little bit, but just kind of setting the stage a little bit, we're seeing markets cooling down for, for real estate. The SERS portfolio itself uh, as, as a whole posted a negative 2.5% return for the second quarter. That brings the year-to-date return to just about 2.25% positive. Um, and as of June 30, the trailing one-year return is about 13%, and the trailing three-year return uh, is just under 10% at, at 97 So overall, you know, we think these are, are solid returns on an absolute basis. We continue to believe that the portfolio is, is well-positioned and that the diversification across strategies, you know, while in the short term sometimes, you know, it does not work to your benefit, over the long run um, really, really should continue to benefit the portfolio as we go forward and, and look forward into 2023 and, and some investment opportunities that we see on the horizon. Um, and, and I guess just, you know, sort of reiterating the, that, that point, you know, real estate really is a long-term asset class. So I would, I would keep that in mind as we look at any, you know, individual quarter's return. If we turn to page three, um, we break down the strategy here by, or break down the portfolio rather, by strategy and by investment structure. And as you can see in the left chart, the portfolio at the end of the quarter was invested about 45% in core and core plus funds, about 11% in publicly traded real estate or REITs. And the remaining 44% was in value added opportunistic strategies. That is further broken down into funds and the separate accounts where uh, the closed end funds make up about 19% and the separate accounts about 25% of the total portfolio. On the right-hand side, you can see that the majority of the value in the closed-end funds, uh, so the, the right-hand side of that chart 
uh, really is is the open end, the core core plus funds, um, and then the REITs are at the bottom. And then as far as the the closed end funds are concerned, the majority of the value um, is still in the investing stage of their life cycle. So closed end funds, they raise capital, they invest capital, then they execute their business plan on those investments, and then look to sell. So when you look at this and you see that you know a pretty meaningful portion of the portfolio is in that investment period stage, those are investments that you know are very early in their life cycle, have not had time to fully execute business plans and harvest uh, harvest their portfolios. So that's another thing to keep in mind as we look at some of the you know shorter term performance. You've got a lot of capital that's just recently been invested and should should continue to generate returns going forward. If we turn to page four, we break things down a little bit differently here, um, looking at exposure by um, by geography and property type. And as you can see um, on the left-hand side here, the portfolio is diversified uh, quite well with regard to geographic region, um, both across the U.S. and then about 18% of the portfolio is invested internationally. Um, about three quarters of that is in Europe and, and most of the remainder in, in Canada. But, uh, but again, very well diversified across the U.S. as well. And then with regard to property type, um, the portfolio, again, highly diversified. Uh, office comprises the largest portion, but we've seen that come down in recent years, uh, while industrial is the, the segment that's grown the most over the last couple of years. And then a little over one quarter of the portfolio is invested in residential properties. Turning ahead to slide five, we show the historical net cash flows for the portfolio. This chart shows the total contributions or, or capital paid in by SERS into the real estate portfolio. Uh, those are the orange bars. And then the green bars show distributions or cash returned to SERS from real estate investments. And generally speaking, the real estate portfolio has been a net cash flow generator for SERS. Um, you know, that's largely attributed to just the fact that it is a very mature portfolio. You've got a lot of existing assets that are kicking off cash flow. Um, still pretty meaningful capital investment uh, due to the recent, you know, the recent commitments to closed end funds. Um, you can see in 2020, in particular, we saw sort of a slowdown in distributions, not just for SERS, but across the real estate market. Um, that has largely, um, you know, sort of returned back to, to somewhat normal levels in 2021 and the first half of 2022. If we turn our attention to the future on page six, um, you know, we're going to hear more about this as we go through the pacing plan a little bit later uh, in the meeting today. Um, but just sort of reiterating some of the recent changes to the portfolio uh, for real estate. At the April Investment Committee meeting, new sub-strategy targets were approved. Um, that will result in Core and Core Plus decreasing from 35 to 25 percent, um, REITs decreasing as well, while value-added and opportunistic targets will increase to, to a larger majority of the portfolio. And you know, just to reiterate those comments that you've heard in, in prior meetings, uh, we do believe that these changes should increase the total expected return for the portfolio while still maintaining some strategic allocations to core, core plus, and REIT strategies. And again, more to come on this um, you know, later today when we, when we go through the 2023 investment, um, the investment pacing plan for real estate, which incorporates these new targets and helps us build to them. Lastly, on page seven, this is where at the beginning of, the, of this presentation, I promised I'd sort of bring us a little bit more current, um, high-level update on the market environment. As I mentioned, core real estate saw really record high returns in the second half of 2021 and into the beginning of this year. That trend has since reversed uh, with returns moderating closer to long-term averages in the third quarter. Um, really driven by downward pressure on appreciation. So said differently, um, assets are still continuing to generate the usual income you'd expect, but the asset values have declined slightly in, in Q3. So 
what's driving this, you know, there's a lot of headlines. Um, the, the key takeaway, I think, should be that overall today, real estate assets are still generally healthy with regard to their operating performance. Um, industrial and residential assets in particular are continuing to pour perform well. They've got historically low vacancy rates and continue and they're continuing to see uh, solid rent growth. Retail has also performed well recently after struggling during the earlier phases of the pandemic. Um, and all three of those property types, industrial, residential, and retail, saw net income levels grow in excess of 10% for the year, the one year ended uh, September 30. So again, solid operating performance for those three property types. Um, office is, I would say, facing a bit more uncertainty today, probably no surprise to, to anyone uh, listening in today. Um, that's, that's just as you know, investors and tenants continue to try and assess the future demand for, for office space. So the challenge really, it's not the operations or the operating performance of the assets, it's really the interest rate environment. Real estate assets are generally valued on a yield basis. So when you have rising interest rates, it puts a downward pressure on those real estate values. It has also had the effect of increasing the cost of debt financing. So, you know, if you're looking to buy a new property today, it's more expensive to take out a loan. Or if you're refinancing an existing asset, you know, your interest rate is going to be higher than what it would have been, you know, one or two years ago. So that's that's some of the downward pressure on, on the market today. But, you know, overall, again, markets are are fairly healthy, capital markets are still functioning, um, and we, we do think there are attractive opportunities for new investments in the real estate market today. Um, and in fact, uh, as, as Mike from Stepstone alluded to on the private equity side, you know, vintage years, uh, really, you know, during periods of uncertainty or potential dislocation have historically performed very well. So, um, you know, all's to say, we, we think the portfolio is in, in good shape today. You know, some, some things we're certainly monitoring in terms of the market environment, but no real, you know, causes for concern for the SERS real estate portfolio. And again, you'll hear more from me a little bit later as we talk about the plan for 2023 and going forward. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you all for your time and see if there's any questions. All right. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, the next item is on 5E. It is a recommendation for a private equity opportunity from the investment team and SIRS private equity consultant, Stepstone Group. If we can go to the CIO intro slides, please. Uh, page four, please. Thank you. So we will cover the closing out of the pacing uh, for 2022. Uh, Stepstone will go into detail on the strategic fit of this opportunity. And Hellman and Freeman, they are here to uh, provide their presentation as well. Um, it's important to note that SERS has over a 30-year relationship with Hellman and Freeman since uh, 1991 when we first participated in their second fund. Uh, to take it up specific to SERS, our pacing that the board approved for 2022 was $1.1 billion for private equity and private credit. Uh, assuming that Hellman and Freeman is approved by the board, uh, our total commitment for private equity will be under. It will be at $965 million which is approximately 12, uh, well, 135 million below the 1.1 billion. So about 12%, I believe. So uh, we will be under target for 2022. Stepstone will go into more detail uh, and, and go through their presentation on future pacing for 2023 and after, um, after the Hellman and Freeman presentation. So if there are no questions, I'll pass it to Stepstone. Uh, to go over the portfolio fit with this Hellman and Friedman fund. Sure, Mike or Matt? Mike Elio here from, yeah, this is Mike Elio here from Stepstone. I won't go into too much detail. We have the GP here as well, and we've given you all about 60 pages worth of our thoughts. But from a portfolio construction 
perspective, look, Hellman and Freeman is a long-term relationship of yours at the larger end of the market. They buy quality companies, and they have done it with a loss ratio that is half of that of their peers. So buying quality companies. They're an experienced team. They're tenured. They've had a strong track record across market cycles, which is exactly what we're looking for in this market and would be a perfect relationship for Pennsylvania to continue within their portfolio. So with that, unless there are any questions, we do have the GP here to go through their presentation. So I don't want to steal all of their thunder or compliment them too much when they can hear me. So with that, I'll pass it off to Helen and Friedman. You're on mute, sir. Helen, you're off mute, but we can't hear you. Can folks hear me? This is Zita from Helen and Friedman. Yeah, we could All right. Well, while Alan sorts out his technology, I'll introduce myself first then. Um, so Zeta, it's great to be here. Um, again, I believe that we met you um, in the context of Fund 10. So wonderful to be here to explain a bit more about ourselves. I'm Zeta, um, sitting in London. I'm a partner at Hellman & Friedman on the investing team. And I'm also the executive sponsor for our ESG efforts across the firm. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And with that, hopefully Alan's audio is now you? up. Can you hear me now? Perfect. We can hear you, Alan. Okay, great. Uh, let me go with that. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Super. Okay, well, thanks. It's nice to see uh, see many of you again. We were here. Uh, I've presented to the, to the board in the past, so it's very nice to see you all and be here. Um, we are... Uh, we are pleased to have the opportunity to continue our partnership with you. We value the partnership. It's been a great partnership for a long period of time, um, as was alluded to. And Helen and Friedman continues to do the same thing we've always done. And our strategy remains the same. Our focus remains the same. Uh, and that's what we'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. We'll keep going through the disclaimer. There we go, To the at a glance. So. Just a, a quick highlight on Hellman and Friedman. So we are we are unique among the larger end of the market in private equity firms. We're currently managing a $24 billion fund that you're invested in, our 10th fund. Um, at that size and into the market, it's unique to have a firm that is that is actually a smaller firm and is a focused firm. So we only do one thing. We have a private equity strategy. That is our only strategy. It's a very concentrated fund. Uh, where we're investing in an average of 12 companies in a portfolio. We think about it as our best ideas fund, and our goal is to have a very focused firm. We have a small firm focused on one strategy, one group of people who are heavily aligned with our limited partners, and we're trying to do uh, one set of things, which is a consistent strategy. It's around high quality. It's around growth, uh, and we've been doing this for a long time with the team who's been at it for a long time. Uh, in the upper right of this slide, you can see our investment committee has been here uh, an average number of 27 years, uh, and we're heavily aligned. Our general partner commitment uh, is substantial, uh, and it has been consistently throughout our funds. We don't charge deal fees or monitoring fees, and so it means that when we make new investments, we're not collecting fees, we're investing, and we, we all are writing checks alongside, uh, alongside you and alongside our limited partners. Um, and you can see on the bottom, we, we think we have a great track record, and, and you have all the data from that from your own performance. So uh, happy to talk more about that. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about what we're trying to do. Again, this has been our strategy that's been consistent over the last 20, 25 years. We currently have 29 companies in our portfolio across a few of the funds. Um, we're targeting high quality. So there are a lot of different strategies, as you just heard, in real estate. There are different approaches to how you invest in real estate. Likewise, with private equity, our approach is to buy scale, high quality growth companies. And so that's the theory. Uh, and we think it's borne out by that which we own and the types of companies which, that we own. Uh, we're trying to buy businesses which are franchises, which are enduring, which have recurring revenue, strong margins, good market positions, uh, and benefit from organic and inorganic growth. Um, the sectors we target uh, on the left, technology, healthcare, 
consumer services and retail, financial services. Um, we tend to be asset, uh, not investing in a lot of asset intensive businesses, a lot more service businesses, a lot more technology and technology enabled businesses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is our track record. We like the fact that it fits on one page because we have one strategy. The columns represent our serial private equity funds, so we do one at a time. We're only at a given point in time investing new capital out of one pool, but we would maintain a portfolio that goes back a couple. Um, everything over on the right to the right of the line would be our newer portfolios that are not particularly seasoned. Those are very young. Uh, those are newer companies that we've just uh, bought. Those take time to settle. Those are young, uh, but those represent all the same strategy and the same approach that we've been using throughout. Um, so it's pretty early days in those. And if you go back to the, you know, fund five and six and seven, those are the ones that are that are now uh, fully or close to fully realized, um, and, and we're pretty proud of those. Um, and overall, on the bottom, you can see our gross IRR has been 30% and a 22% net IRR over this entire period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is our team. Uh, it's just, uh, on the one hand, a bunch of boxes and headshots, but I think importantly, uh, again, it fits on one page. We're a smaller, cohesive team. Uh, there's an incredible tenure among this group, even the, even the more junior folks or the, the, the younger crowd here has been around for a long time and is very well tenured. We have a strong promote from within culture. Uh, and that's meant that we've uh, we've grown people who have experience and have perspective uh, that's consistent over a long period of time, and it's meant consistency in our strategy and our approach and our mindset. Um, we have three offices, San Francisco, New York, and London, uh, and we operate really as one group across those offices. Um, we've built out a pretty strong operating team, so there's an operating team embedded in here as well uh, where we're trying to provide more capability into our portfolio companies. But again, our mantra, uh, there's always more to do and more value to add in our portfolio, but our mantra is all about buying high quality growth businesses um, where nine times out of 10, the strategy is to accelerate in more of the same uh, and step on the gas given what the company is doing now rather than some wholesale change uh, and re, you know, reorientation of what a company is doing uh, or trying to turn around broken things. That's not the strategy that we employ. So the team has been consistent for a long period of time. Um, what you've invested in in the past is very consistent with what you'd be investing in in the future. Um, and with that, let me pass it over to Zita, and then we'll come back and uh, happy to answer any questions after she's done talking about ESG. Next slide, please. Thank you, Alan. Um, so I'm going to take the next couple of slides just to give you a bit of background on our approach to ESG. And on this first slide, I'm going to give you the overview um, on our philosophy and approach. And you know, I'd start by saying that ESG is a core part of fulfilling our mission and, and investment philosophy. And our mission is to deliver the best risk-adjusted returns to you, our investors. And so ESG factor are considered along the way as a way to mitigate risk and to grow equity value at our companies. That's, that's how we approach it. And we do um, take this approach really through two primary tools. Uh, one is to be active shareholders influencing our companies at the board level. Um, and the second is to have a culture of continuous improvement in respect of ESG and respect really of everything. So we're continuously reviewing how we do things and how we can do them better. Um, so that's the quick bird's eye view of how ESG fits into our investing approach. If we move to the next slide, please. I'm going to do a bit of a quick deeper dive into um, a key area of the ESG space, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, for this topic, I wanted to highlight first, we, we really do believe that diverse, inclusive, and equitable organizations are more successful. Um, they're more successful as evidenced by greater rates of innovation, higher employee satisfaction and retention. You know, those are some examples of why we think it's important. And we address uh, DEIB in a few different ways, both at our portfolio companies and at h and as a GP. Um, so you've got that listed on the slide. I'm just going to pick out a couple of examples for you today and a couple of stats on each of those dimensions. Um, on the portfolio dimension, we launched an initiative to improve the diversity of our boards uh, not long ago. And through that initiative, we now have 80% of our portfolio companies that have at least one woman on their board and 60% 
have at least one person from another underrepresented group in addition. Um, so we've made progress on the diversity of our boards, which we think is really important for tone from the top, and we continue to push on that. On the H and F side, so us as, a, as an organization ourselves, uh, we do look to promote uh, these values. And uh, an example I'll give you of that is that this year in 2022, we've appointed a very senior role for the first time, a chief people officer, to oversee um, culture, DEIB, and talent for the first time. She's going to really up our game in this area. Um, and I'll share a couple quick stats as to where we are today. So that's there at the bottom of the slide there. You can see that today just over half of our employees are women and around a third of our employees are from underrepresented groups. Um, within that, we like to focus in on the investment professionals. How are we doing on that population? Slightly less diverse there today. 44% of our investment professionals are from underrepresented groups. And that's there that's key focus for us in terms of moving those stats along. So that I'll, I'll pause, hand back over to Alan, um, who will wrap us up here. Thanks. Um, so I think that's it for our prepared materials. Um, we, uh, again, I'd like, I'd like to emphasize the first point, which is uh, we're thrilled with the partnership with Pennsylvania. We appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to continuing it. Uh, like I said, you'll be investing in uh, in more of the same, and you'll be investing uh, alongside all of us who are, you know, all, all in, uh, as it were, on our fund and all this have been. So with that, we'll take questions. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Zita and Alan. Uh, does the board have any questions for the Hellman and Friedman team? The treasurer has her hand. Treasurer. Treasurer Garrity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so my question was, um, can you comment on your historic and planned exposure to crypto in the industry? Sure. Um, Thanks. Sure, happy to. Uh, the historical answer is, uh, I want to say zero. I believe zero, but I, I don't know if somewhere, somehow, there's some uh, tangential exposure. So certainly n nowhere in our strategy are we... <clears throat> are we touching crypto? There may be some of our companies who, in payments, who uh, are doing exploration or research on blockchain technologies. But uh, crypto would be, if it were there, it would be it would be totally inconsequential uh, footnote. And likewise with the future, no no plans there. Thank thank you so much. And just one last question, and that's just um, just can you comment on balancing ESG with prudent person? Sure. Um, in what part of prudent person are you are you most focused on? Well, uh, basically that you know the primary responsibility should be you know to earn a return and and to take care of uh, the beneficiaries. Yeah. Yeah. Look, we we believe um, we believe that our primary responsibility is to all of our limited partners, and we sign up to to optimize returns. We've disclosed the strategy that we're going to use to get there. We think that when we look at a company, we look at a franchise, we're going to look at it holistically, and we're trying to buy high-quality things that are enduring over a long period of time. There are some ESG factors, numerous ESG factors, which can bear directly on the long-term sustainability of a business, and so we're going to take all of those in mind. Um, and we're not, fortunately, we're not investing in the areas where we think there's any trade-off that needs to be had and that we can do the right thing uh, by employees. And that means, you know, not just, you know, obeying all the laws and staying in the lines, which, of course, we do. And that's core to what we do. Um, but we do think we're trying to go beyond that and do the right thing. And so when it comes to representation, when it comes to DEI, uh, and inclusiveness of our employee bases, creating opportunities for a wide range of people, um, minimizing our externalities in the world uh, of our economic activity. We think we can do all of those things in a way that doesn't ever threaten or challenge uh, our ability to earn outstanding returns. Okay, thank you. Senator DeSanto. Senator DeSanto. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, treasurer answer asked my question. My overarching concern um, with all the problems you're seeing in the ESG space and greenwashing and, you know, making hiring decisions based on gender and race as opposed to uh, core competencies, you asked that. Um, you answered that part of the question very well. 
But my concern is with this long relationship and outstanding returns that you've provided to SERS over the years, with all the misinformation and misreporting and, and so on, how can you assure us that your ESG uh, initiatives are not going to affect our expected returns that you've provided to us over the last number of years? Yeah, look, our, our view on it, first of all, is with, with respect to what we're doing in ESG, we're going to be direct with you. We've told you exactly what it is, the things we care about, the things we're focused on. And, and I don't, I'm don't. i highly confident that neither in the past nor in the future will any of those things uh, be at odds with, and I think they'll be enhancing of our ability to deliver excellent returns. Thank you. I can take it. Uh, any other questions? Uh, 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 Alan and Zita, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. We really appreciate that and appreciate our longstanding relationship. Uh, any uh, further questions before we uh, have the motion? Okay. Mr. Uh, Chairman, Senator sure. Hughes here. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, if uh, a question, uh, a comment, and then a question. All right. I, I was I was not under the impression that commitments to ESG and commitments to um, diversity were a negative factor with respect to performance. I always thought that that was a positive factor, but um, I'll leave that for another conversation. Um, to the gentleman, I'm looking at the last chart, which is staying on um, my screen where it says 44% of H&F investment professionals are from underrepresented groups. Uh, can you define, what is your definition of underrepresented groups? Absolutely, I'm happy to take that. It is in the footnote, which is teeny tiny on your screen, um, so you can very, read it. Very uh, teeny, after. Very teeny But I will, yes. I will voice it over for you. I just want to let you know you can take it away and look at it. Um, the definition of underrepresented group um, are people who self-identify as black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, or who identify as two or more ethnicities. Um, it also ref reflects uh, gender. So that, that's the definition. Okay. 52% uh, of H&F employees are women, 30% 30 30 from other underrepresented groups. All right. Um, and to the extent, I think I just heard you say um, in your presentation that um, you're onboarding someone or you have just onboarded someone recent, a people person. Did I hear that? Am I saying that correctly? That's right. A chief people okay. officer has just joined people weeks ago. Yes. A chief people officer. That's a new that's a new one. But that's good. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. All right. Um and 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 that's a a, a relatively new position. In, internally for us. Certainly all of our companies would have chief people officers and we've for a long time spent the bulk of the people we touch are employees of the portfolio companies we're invested in. Whether there are 150 right. people at Hellman and Friedman, there'd be tens of thousands of people employed in portfolio companies we and you are invested in. Okay. All right. So I just I, 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 I just want to make sure I'm consistent with previous conversations that this committee and the board has had around the issues of diversity that um, uh, that um, you all understand that this is important to us. This is important to this organization, um, and uh, that it be pursued at the highest level. Um, and as I said, given the fact that we know some extremely high-performing entities um, that are led and run um, by diverse organizations, um, that there's no need to consider in any way, shape, or form that there's a sacrifice in performance because there's an, an attempt to address um, issues of inclusion and and diversity. Um, I, I know I know it is it is um, important to this member and to a number of other members on, on this committee and this board that this be pursued um, with an extreme level of regression. Um, and I'm confident that um, quality of performance will not be sacrificed um, hitting if you hit um, high marks in those space. 
um, those spaces. So I just want to make sure that that statement was made uh, and that you understand it uh, and that a number of us are paying attention to it. All right. Great. We, we appreciate that. I mean, look, we, we, uh, we, we don't from our perspective, we don't need to get into the any of the political parts of it or the controversial parts of it. For us, it's very straightforward, which is if we create opportunities inside of our portfolio companies and at our firm where the impediments to success are removed for women, for people of color, that's wildly beneficial to the individuals and to the organizations. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you, thanks. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Jordan has his hand up, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. Uh, when I reviewed the materials on H&F's uh, opportunity here, I noticed that uh, this fund does not offer a preferred return, and that uh, seems to be your historical approach on this. And I'm just wondering, that that's somewhat different than a lot of funds we see where there is a preferred return. I'm wondering how that benefits the limited partners. Yeah. So we you're you're correct in that historically we've never had a preferred return and we we haven't felt it necessary and it's certainly never been relevant given the performance. Um, and and look, it it hasn't been relevant. We don't think it'll be relevant in the future. And I would just say the way it benefits limited partners is, you know, when it matters, when you would like to benefit and invoke the preferred return, I think it can lead to perversions and misalignment between the LP and the GP, um, and the potential for skewed decision making, which which isn't actually in the limited partner's best interest. So I think ironically, when it when it matters most for you, it has perverse effects on incentives. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, any any further questions before we go to a motion? Okay, seeing no hands. Uh, I move that the Investment Committee recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board commit up to $100 million to Hellman and Freeman Capital Partners 11 LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as a follow-on investment within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Okay, it is improperly uh, uh, moved and seconded. Any further question before we go to vote? Okay, hearing none. Um, may we have a roll call uh, vote, please, uh, Jared? Yes. Chair Becker? Aye. Senator DeSanto? Aye. Mr. Fillman? Aye. Representative Frankel? Beloga for Representative Frankel, aye. Thank you. Treasurer Garrity? Aye. Senator Hughes? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schimmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Mr. Thal? Aye. Secretary Vang? Here, uh, aye. <coughs> Twelve yeses. I'm sorry, eleven. Eleven, 11. yeses. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. So uh, the motion's passed, and we will make that recommendation uh, to the board uh, next uh, next week. So thank you very much, uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Bill. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next topic of discussion is under Section 5F. Stepstone will review uh, our pacing modeling as well as have a discussion on what our target pacing uh, should be in 2023 and after. Uh, Mike or Matt, please. Yep, I'll run through this one. Thanks, Bill. Um, 
we can just go straight to to slide three, the first slide with content on it, and and <clears throat> just a little bit of table setting before we jump into some numbers here. Um, we talked about pacing about this time last year. We're doing it this year. We will do this again next year. This should and will continue to be an iterative and annual conversation as we reflect on the portfolio. But as we take a step back, uh, like all pacing conversations in your strategic asset allocation conversations, <clears throat> this is intended to be a long-term pacing objective and modeling exercise for what is inherently a long-term asset class in the private markets. And so just to level set some objectives, what we've got here at the top of the page, these are the same as they were last year uh, and will be the same next year. Our goal here is to meet the long-term objective of service private equity portfolio having a 16% allocation to private equity as a percent of total plan assets. Today, uh, as noted earlier by Tom, we're at 19.9 plus 1.2 for private credit. We are over target uh, and, and that'll be reflected in the num numbers we talk about here. But there is a glide that you'll see in our recommendation here that gets you back below target on a long-term basis. Our goal in getting the 16% private equity is to get attractive consistent risk adjusted returns uh, that are accretive to your overall overall portfolio. Mike talked about the reporting on private equity. We're at 12.6% since inception in the asset class. Year to date, even more importantly, that we've talked about the, the returns through the cycle for this asset class. We're up 2.8% on a one-year basis for the Russell 3000 being down over, over 14% over the same period. Uh, we are focused, and we've talked about this with you all before, on making sure that there aren't large variations in the way that you commit to this asset class. Again, a long-term asset class. We're not trying to be market timing, but we do want to take a moment to recognize, as, as Mike and Matt Ritter talked about for, for real estate as well, uh, times of dislocation are great times to be committing to private equity. And <clears throat> what's happened historically in the past, as Matt highlighted, and, and I'll just make mention again, is that those vintage years, that the crisis years and the recovery years have historically been the strongest performing vintage years in private equity. And so despite the challenges in total plan assets, despite the challenges of public, a strong public macro environment, I think what you'll hear from us as part of the recommendation is stay the course and can, can continue to commit to private equity. So just jumping into the bottom half of, of slide three here, uh, I'm not gonna read every word on the page. There is a lot here. The punchline is it's, it's been a tough year for the public markets. It's been a good year for your private portfolio. You've continued to grow, as I said, despite challenges in the public markets. At this point last year, uh, we approved a pacing of $1.1 billion to the combined private equity and private credit portfolios to get us to our 16% our target. That was below the model suggested number, and so a concession reflecting on the fact that at some point in 2022 and 2023, where we're likely to face uh, pressure from a macro perspective and, and pressure on total plan assets that happened. Uh, and so I think reflecting on that, it was a, it was a good decision that we made it last year. Um, to put some hard numbers around that, total plan assets when we'd run it a year ago, September 30th, were 38 billion, they're 32 and a half now. And so a compression in total plan assets. What we've recommended and what you'll see reflected through the deck here is uh, a little bit of deceleration versus that 1.1 to a 1.0, 1, 1 billion exactly. Uh, average annual commitment pacing over the next 10 years. What that'll do is is you'll be over target for a bit, and you'll see that uh, as we flip through th through more slides here. You'll be over target for a bit, but long term, you'll glide back below target. The break even point is around 2026, uh, as modeled right now, and, and we've run some scenarios that we'll talk through as well. You know, I think reflecting on on the current market environment where we sit right now. The reality is, as we're talking about one billion, that is the consistent annual number. Um, yeah, I think there, there's a, a sober recognition that next year may be another tough vintage year, and so the recommendation is up to one billion. Uh, I think the reality is, you, you may see a year like this year where where Bill had touched on this, we're close to 950 versus target of 1.1, and so maybe we're closer to 800 versus the one billion target next year, and sort of recognition of everything that's going on. Let me flip forward two slides to slide five, um, which I won't spend a whole lot of time on. This just reflects everything that I'm talking about here and shows the portfolio. Um, the first date on here is year on 23. We've got the 22 projection as well on other slides, but it just shows everything I'm talking about. The, the break even at a billion dollars a year is that you will stay over the target uh, for the next few years, that you will slide back below target on a long-term basis and eventually settle in at that 14-ish percent number. Um, it's very, very similar to what you saw last year. Flip forward one more slide, um, start talking about some sensitivities, and we've got three slides of sensitivities. I'm going to actually just spend most, if not all, of my time before breaking for questions on this slide here. 
This is going to be a very familiar slide um, to folks that looked at it last year, but uh, a day feels like a year in the period that we've been in, so I'm just going to remind folks and everything that's going on here. What we've done here is we've taken a few different uh, stress sensitivities of the portfolio. The solid blue line is the base case modeled sensitivity for your plan assets. That assumes the total plan assets grow from where they were in September of this year, that $32.5 billion number, by 2% per year. The back end into that is a 7% net investment return for your portfolio. That's the regular way, you know, worlds are going as it's supposed to long-term projection for the portfolio, the solid blue line. The dotted lines are various sensitivities that we've run, and, and again, consistent with last year. The green and the gray are pretty easy, pretty simple ones. Um, those assume a, a plus or minus 200 basis point net investment return for your, for your portfolio. What that means as an end user is that if you have a 9% net investment return, the gray line, you have 5.3% plain asset growth. You obviously end up substantially under target for private equity if the plant assets are outperforming and growing faster. Uh, on the flip side, if you have a 5% net investment return instead of 7, so it's 200 basis point deceleration, you have 50 basis points of long-term annual plant asset growth, you end up almost exactly in line with your target in 2032. And, and what I'll tell you is there's two years the model spits out that are not included in this chart, but 2034, you end up at 15.8 instead of 16.2. So sort so, of so flirting with your target on a long-term basis uh, in that 5% net investment return. And then the orange line uh, is a shock scenario, very similar to what we ran last year. That assumes that next year, in 2023, we have a negative 20%, so a 20% investment loss next year. Uh, that results in plan assets falling off by about 25%. We're in the $25 billion range. That scenario, for what it's worth, also suggests that plan assets will not recover to current levels, so September 2022 levels. Uh, until 2036, so I'd say a, a draconian drown, downside scenario as, as we're thinking about pacing sensitivity. In that scenario, uh, unsurprisingly, given that you're committing to the asset class, and unsurprisingly, given that plan assets do not recover to where they are right now, you remain elevated and above target. And I think we all of these things are important um, as we think about the lay of the land and, and, and obviously sort of beneficial for laying out where we are right now. Next two slides, um, I, don't, I don't need to land on them in a lot of detail. The, the, the one after this has some commitment sensitivities. What happens if we commit plus or minus $100 million per year? The one after that has some AUM sensitivities. What happens if plan assets grow 50 basis points faster or slower? And you can see where you end up. The reality is uh, the range of returns in any of those scenarios is, is pretty close to the overall 16% target. And I'd say if, if plan assets grow at 1% per year instead of 50 basis points per year, again, you're, you're sort of pretty close to, to your overall target, um, but still end up below it. And so that's the punchline on pacing. I think the, the, the code of this whole thing, again, is that um, we don't recommend slowing down. The message is stay the course. It's 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 tough. We're over target. There's there's probably some storms on the horizon as we think about what's going on in the macro environment. The reality is the guys have talked about earlier is this is the best time uh, if past is precedent. Which it, <laughs> the disclaimer is always that it's not. But uh, if history if history repeats itself, this is going to be one of the better times to invest in the private markets. And so the core of the message is is stay the course, um, but but sort of be measured and reasonable about what's coming. Maybe I'll pause there. That was a lot in just a few minutes talking about pacing, but happy to answer any questions. Treasurer Gallardy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's it's more of a comment. Um, one thing I've learned um, since sitting on these pension boards is that pacing is an absolutely brilliant marketing ploy because we're always going to be spending um, more money um, over our target. And the other thing I would like to say is that given that we're around 20% allocation, I personally would be much more comfortable with a pacing budget of seven to 800 million as opposed to the, the billion, one billion. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your comment, Treasurer. Um, we. We had uh, some discussions with Stepstone over the last several weeks, as well as um, with NEPC. And you know, I, I, Stepstone is comfortable with uh, reducing their recommended pacing to one billion in light of the uh, current overallocation to private equity, and. Jim Nolan is also uh, comfortable with that, as well as 
Chair Becker. Uh, we, we've had multiple discussions on that. So if it's, uh, you know, if there's any other questions, we can continue with 2023 with uh, the anticipated uh, pacing of 800 million, if that's okay with the board and treasurer. Uh, Mr. Vague, Secretary Vague. Thank you. I, you know, I agree with the treasurer. The, the funny thing, you can agree to any allocation you want, and if your pacing is on the high end of the range, then what happens is you kind of never get there. And I think that's the substance of uh, of uh, where the treasurer was going with this. And so, you know, we, we, we've kind of observed that in other pension funds as well. So I, I would just echo what the treasurer said and suggest where there's the opportunity to do a little less sure wouldn't hurt our feelings yes sir Th thank you very much for your comments so we can proceed working with stepstone on the 2023 pacing at 800 million if that works for everyone mm -hmm. I couldn't hear. What was that, works for me uh, 800 All right, thank you. Uh, Secretary Vague, do you have additional questions? I apologize. You sh I should have taken my hand down. Sorry. Uh, no, no need to apologize. Just checking. All right. Um, NEPC, uh, Mike or Matt, are you guys uh, finished with uh, the presentation? That's it. Appreciate it, Bill. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item for discussion is under section 5G and this is from NEPC serves real estate consultant Matt Ritter please great thanks Bill um, so this is you know very similar to what you just saw for private equity a, a similar exercise in terms of investment pacing for the real estate portfolio um, so if we start on page two here um, just a quick level set on where things stand today. SERS has a current target allocation to real estate of 7%. Um, that target has come down pretty meaningfully in recent years. Um, it came down from 12% to 8% in 2019, and then further to 7% in 2021. So at June 30, when we the data that we used to, to run this analysis, um, real estate represented about 9% of the total portfolio. So overweight relative to that new target, um, and um, you know certainly we'll be we'll be working to to lower that over time. I think you know we also have a little bit of a interesting time frame here where real estate has performed had been performing quite well up through June 30 while you know some of the public markets um, you know had sold off so a little bit of a of a, a timing nuance there as well but the end result is we are slightly overweight the target the real estate portfolio in addition to that just sort of high level target allocation has some sub strategy target allocations um, which we've discussed with the investment committee in, in a couple of recent meetings um, earlier this year we adjusted those sub strategy targets to what you see on this page here and and which I alluded to during the quarterly performance update but the the new up the new targets are 70% to non core real estate which includes value add and opportunistic strategies and then 25% to core and core plus and the remaining 5% to publicly traded real estate or REITs. So if we turn to the next slide, page three, um, this, the pacing and strategic plan that I'm presenting today will focus on the following primary objectives. So the first is to get to and, and try to remain near that 7% target total allocation. Secondly, we'll look to achieve and maintain sub-strategy target allocations that I just highlighted. And then lastly, we'd like to achieve vintage year diversification, which simply means making regular annual commitments. Similar to what Matt, Matt Roach said on the private equity side, you want to try to minimize the risk of market timing. In other words, you don't want to commit a you know, billion dollars this year and only a hundred million dollars the next year. Um, you're sort of implicitly taking a big bet on, on one vintage year when you do that. 
this plan will take several years to implement. We've got a few things, a few moving pieces here in terms of you know the change in target total allocation as well as the change in the substrategy allocations. Um, and you know, just keeping in mind that real estate is a a pretty slow moving asset class. These things take time to implement, and and all the same at the same time, you know, the market and the rest of the portfolio are, are moving targets as well. So you know, similar to what Stepstone had stated on the private equity side, we will of course be revisiting this plan on an annual basis to continue to adjust for you know those changes. The, the market will never do exactly what our what the assumptions of the model uh, predict it will do. So this, this requires sort of an annual monitoring and updating. So if we turn to next slide, page four, um, what's the overall recommendation? Well, with those objectives that I just touched on in mind, uh, we recommend that in 2023, SERS look to basically do do kind of two two components here. One is look to reinvest, or sorry, receive rather than reinvest the dividends from the open end core, core plus, and REIT strategies. That should help uh, get that overweight to those strategies, you know, closer to target. And then secondly, we recommend committing a total of $200 million to non-core real estate funds. Um, this will, given, given the sizing of recent commitments, um, you know, perhaps in the 50 to $100 million range to an individual fund, that will likely result in two or three real estate fund recommendations for next year. But again, the, the total dollar amount target would be $200 million for 2023. And then going forward, we anticipate a similar pacing of about $200 million of new commitments per year. Um, that's for the next several years, and then it, it slightly increases in later years. But again, before we get to 2026, we'll have updated this plan a, a couple of times. So um, I think we really you know, focus on the, the next couple of years here. Um, and then NEPC will, of course, you know, continue to work with the SERS Investment Office to monitor the substrategy allocations and recommend rebalancing as needed. Um, and again, you'll you'll see an updated version of this uh, probably around this time each year going forward. So that's the overall recommendation. The next couple of slides um, have some some pictures to help tell the story. If we go ahead to slide six. Um, this is just the high-level overview. The top left here are the sort of key inputs to the plan, including you know where where we're starting in terms of allocation, um, total exposure, which includes the current existing net asset value plus unfunded, uncalled commitments, um, and then the right-hand side just simply shows the the breakdown by strategy. That should look very similar to or exactly the same as what you just saw in the quarterly performance update. Um, Turning to the next page, this chart is is a one of the big uh, I think you know kind of takeaways that helps kind of paint the picture of why pacing plans are important. Um, so what you see here, there's a lot on the page, but if we just focus on the top half of the page, the green bars represent the net asset value for real estate, and we broke it down into two components. The solid green is the existing portfolio. So said differently, if you did nothing and made no new commitments, that would sort of be the you know the projected path of the real estate portfolio. You see it coming down quite a bit as the existing closed end funds you know continue to invest and, and later liquidate. Um, and then the lighter green includes the projected new commitments. So in total, that green bar is your projected real estate asset value. The blue the blue bar is the unfunded commit the unfunded uh, commitments. So capital that's been committed to funds but hasn't been called yet. The goal here really is to try to keep that green the two green bars together you know combined uh, right at that red line. So the red line represents the target real estate net asset value. In other words, it's that seven percent target growing at the assumed growth rate for the overall portfolio. So again, a, a lot on the page and maybe a lot to digest, but the the real focus again is to try to keep the green bars right at that red line. You can see that today. We are, you know, quite over allocated, as I discussed earlier. But the plan is to bring that down over time, and then try to, you know, kind of hug that red line. If we turn to slide eight, 
we show the future projected commitments. And the emphasis here, again, is on vintage year diversification, um, you know, really a steady and consistent pacing. So you've got that $200 million recommendation for next year and the following couple of years before it, it increases slightly. Um, turning ahead to slide nine, similar to with private equity, we show a couple of different scenarios here. So the base case is what I just showed you, the 200 million going up to 250 per year. And then we show two other scenarios, one where the commitment pace is slightly increased and one where it is slightly decreased. In either case, adjusting the annual commitments by $50 million. And so you can see what effect that has. Um, you know, not not too much of an effect in the near term, but as we get further out, you know, you can see those those lines separate a little bit further. Um, and then slide ten simply shows the projected substrategy allocations. And, and again, this you know probably sound like a broken record. It's it's a long term plan. It's going to take a few years to get there, but ultimately we're looking to you know increase the allocation that is. Uh, of the portfolio that is the, the non-core like value add and opportunistic part of the strategy while the core, core plus and REITs will come down slightly. Um, and then if we go ahead a couple of slides to 12, um, similar to StepStone, we did some uh, sensitivity analyses and and the assumptions, or I should say that the, the change in assumptions is exactly the same as what Matt Roach presented. So. Um, the only change here in each of the scenarios is to the total plan net growth rate. So if we turn ahead to slide 13, we summarize what those scenarios are. And again, Matt kind of already touched on these, but there's the base case, which is the pacing plan I just presented. And then we've got a downside scenario and an upside scenario where the total plan grows either faster or slower than than the base case, and then the shock scenario, which assumes a you know, negative 20% return for the first year. These are the exact same scenarios that we presented this time last year, um, you know, just updating for a, a, new, a new start date of 2022. So slide 14 shows these projected scenarios. And you can see, you know, quite a bit of variability here in terms of, you know, where the real estate portfolio winds up, um, you know, a few years out in terms of percent allocation of the total portfolio. I think this is a, a useful tool just to see what those range of outcomes could look like over the next couple of years, depending on the, the total plan growth rate. Um, but again, to reiterate something I've already said a few times, this is something we're going to be revisiting annually. So in other words, you know, if one of these alternate scenarios does occur, you know, we're not going to suddenly find ourselves in 2027 and be way out of whack with the target because we'll be revisiting this annually and can adjust the pacing plan based on what is actually happening in the market and actually happening in the portfolio to make sure we're staying, you know, as close to on track as we can. So with that, that's the that's the real estate pacing plan for next year. Happy to answer any questions if there are any. Otherwise, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, so the recommendation from staff and consultant is to target a $200 million uh, pacing target for 2023 to the value add opportunistic real estate funds. Um, are there any questions from the board? All right, well, thank you very much, Matt. The thank next you. item for discussion is in Section 5H. Callan also serves as the investment consultant for uh, CERS Defined Contribution Plan and the Deferred Compensation Plan. Um, we asked Callan to conduct a review of our investment structure and investment options within those two plans. Uh, the bottom line and is that, and I think this is very important, is, is that our, you know, after Callan's review, you know, the, the structure and the options are, are, are sound and, and we do have a very diversified uh, selection of investment options, but also not too many because, because you know, if you have too many options, it, 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 you know, studies have shown that it decreases participation 
potentially creating confusion. So with that said, uh, uh, Section 5H, uh, with the Callan team, please. Okay. Thank you, Bill, and good morning again, everyone. So we do believe doing these periodic, what we call investment structure evaluations, is good practice for fiduciaries that are overseeing defined contribution plans. In this case, it's the 401A and the 457B. And what we do in this process is look at the structure of the plan. So what types of options are being offered? There is a particular focus on the default. So the investment option that a participant will go into if they do not make an election. There's heightened scrutiny on that from a fiduciary perspective. So we look at, in this case, it's the BlackRock targeting funds. We review that and also all the other options that are available to a participant that wishes to create their own portfolio using one or several options that are available on the plan. If you go to slide two, so the executive summary, and you'll see there what we're, uh, one more uh, back please. Yeah, so the executive summary. So our colleague Patrick Wisdom from our defined contribution group is here to help us review this. What we observe overall is that these plans are sound, so they're, offering a reasonable number of options. It's not overwhelming to participants, and we'll talk more about that from a behavioral perspective, the importance of that. It's providing participants with an appropriate range of asset classes and doing so with well-diversified options that are offered at a low cost. This set of options could be left as is. What we do offer for consideration, and we'll talk more about this, is in the future, potentially offering an active option for core plus fixed income. So that's active management in the area of fixed income. It's an area where active management has demonstrated that it can work well, net of fees. And then the other is in the, what we call diversified real assets option area. So this, this is a form of inflation hedging in an investment portfolio. Today, tips are offered as the option there. This is a set of products that are more diversified. So think of products that combine asset classes like commodities, REITs, and TIPS into one fund, for example. And the idea being that different asset classes respond to inflation in different ways, particularly where the areas of inflation are that are most prominent. So that's potentially an area for consideration. It doesn't require action by the investment committee today. We will go through some key slides of the presentation, not all of them in the interest of time, and please stop us at any point if you have a question or a comment. So, Pat, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Tom, for that introduction. and pleasure to speak with you all this morning. I'm gonna start off my comments on page six of this analysis. And on page six, we provide an overview for how we view defined contribution investment structures. And it's gonna be um, one more page forward, I believe. Yep, this is one, thank you. Um, so for our DC clients, we depict investment structures within the context of a three-tiered framework. We show those three tiers here on the right-hand side. Uh, the first tier is what we call our asset allocation tier, and this contains investment options that are geared for participants who prefer to take a more passive approach and delegate the asset allocation decision to a professional manager. Within the context of your plans, we would include the BlackRock Life Path Index Fund, the default option as the primary asset allocation option. In addition to the BlackRock Life Path Index Funds, there also is a managed account platform. Um, we got some participant level data from Empower to help us run this analysis. We saw that within the deferred comp plan, there was roughly 550 million in the managed account platform as of July 26th of 2022. 
and he designed a contribution plan that was smaller at about $1.4 million. Um, but the managed account platform is another example of an asset allocation service uh, that the do-it-for-me type participants can use to delegate that asset allocation decision. In Tier 2, we have what we call our core investment options. These cover the asset classes listed here um, that are intended to serve as the building blocks of a diversified portfolio for those participants that want to take a more active-handed approach in designing their own portfolios. So here we include things like capital preservation or fixed income, uh, tips, U.S. large cap, small cap, and non-U.S. equity. And then any asset class that is not considered core, we would categorize outside of Tier 2 within Tier 3, which is our specialty tier. Um, we typically recommend that DC plans try to offer a more limited set of specialty options um, as to not confuse participants. And so within Tier 3, uh, the PA service plans offer a self-directed brokerage window. Uh, which we generally view as an effective way for participants that want other asset class exposures outside of those offered in the core lineup, provide them that avenue to be able to do that. So on the following page, uh, we show the investment structure of the deferred compensation plan uh, within this framework. In total, there are eight investment options. You'll see that the targeted funds are categorized within Tier 1, the core options in the blue tier, and then the brokerage window in the specialty tier. Uh, looking at the deferred comp plan, you'll note that most of the assets are concentrated in three of the investment options. Uh, those are the target date funds with roughly 20%, stable value option at about 30%, and the passive large cap equity index also at about 30%. And so um, I think this makes sense. We also have some information in here where we looked at the demographics of each plan, and we noted that uh, the deferred comp plan tends to be a little bit older in terms of the participants that are in it compared to the uh, defined contribution plan. And so that would, I think, make the large allocation to stable value more intuitive based on that demographic makeup. If we move to page Eight, uh, the following page, we have the three-tiered investment structure for the defined contribution plan. One thing we noted for the defined contribution plan is that it is uh, primarily made up of younger participants, uh, not too surprising to see given the more recent conception of the plan, but you'll see that that comes out to play in terms of the pretty high allocation to the target date funds. Uh, so you'll see that in the 401A plan, about nine and 10 uh, participant dollars were held within the BlackRock Life Path target date funds as of July 26th of this year, um, with smaller allocations to the other investment options. Before we move on, also just wanted to point out the differences between the two investment structures. On the previous slide, we saw that through the Deferred compensation plan, participants do have the ability to allocate to the service stable value option, which is not available in the 401A plan. However, in the 401A plan, there are a couple of options that participants do have access to, not in the 457B plan, and those include the short-term bond index fund, the passive tips option, as well as the passive all-cap equity option. If we move ahead um, a few pages to page 12 of our report, we have some information um, from a couple of internal tools here at Kellen that we use to benchmark how the plan's current investment lineup compares to a large sample of other defined contribution plans. And so here on page 12, we show some data from what we call the Kellen Defined Contribution Index. Uh, the Kellen DC Index reports on more than 100 defined contribution plans. Together, they have more than $400 billion in combined plan assets. 
And it's a pretty powerful tool that allows us to benchmark asset class flows, the average and median number of options that a DC plan offers, as well as the prevalence of different asset classes over time. The two data points that we look at on this page are the average number of options offered by plans in the DC index going back to 2007. You'll see that that is in the left-hand chart. And then on the right-hand side, we look at the prevalence of asset classes among the 100-plus plans that are contained within the index. So first, focusing on the number of options, what you'll see is that the average DC plan has typically ranged between 11 and 14, going back to 2007. Um, so the 457B plan with seven investment options, excluding the target date funds in that count, and the 401A plan with nine do offer slightly fewer options than the average plan, uh, which has about 14. However, it is worthwhile to point out that within the index, there are several plans that do fall on the higher side in terms of the number of options they offer. Uh, there are several plans that offer upwards of 30. And so those outlier val values do pull up the average quite a bit. But I think it's important to consider these two things hand in hand, the number of options in the asset classes, uh, as you'll see on the right hand side, in terms of what participants have access to, there don't appear to be any major gaps. Um, the two plans together provide access to each of the asset classes offered by at least 40% of plans. Uh, there is one exception and that is a balanced fund. However, um, the percentage of plans that offer a balanced fund has tended to decline over time as more plans have adopted target date funds on the PPA of 2006. Um, and so we don't really see a whole lot of value in offering a balanced fund alongside a target date fund, which has that added, added benefit of dynamically shifting participants' allocations as they age and uh, placing them along a de-risking glide path, which balanced funds with their static allocations do not offer. So with that framework in mind, I think um, this page does a pretty good job of showing, as Tom mentioned, that the current lineup is sound. It provides a reasonable number of options and it also provides access to the asset classes that other participants tend to have access to. So we don't really view it as necessary to make any changes to the investment structure. However, we do believe there are a couple of areas where improvements could potentially be made at the margins. And so I'm gonna move ahead to page 21 where first we focus on a couple of potential marginal improvements for the deferred compensation plan. And so Tom mentioned these a bit up front, um, but in yellow here, we've shown a couple of potential proposed changes that could be considered for the 457B plan. I'm first gonna focus on the core plus fixed income change. Um, Currently, the 457B plan offers two active options. Those are within capital preservation. We do believe that offering an active core plus fixed income option could be beneficial for participants given the relative success that core plus fixed income managers have had over time adding value above their benchmarks, uh, specifically the Bloomberg U.S. aggregate bond index. We have some analysis following this slide that looks at um, how core plus six income managers have done over time. And um, we don't have to get into the specific numbers, but just really wanted to call out that given the fact that uh, active core plus managers have the ability to manage their credit and duration exposure, uh, that duration piece is really important now given the interest rate environment we find ourselves in. Um, that really has helped them um, beat the U.S. aggregate bond index um, at, at a, you know, successful clip over multiple 
um, extended time periods. So we do think that that could be an area to consider um, adding a manager within. The second area is uh, within real return. Uh, we think there could be value in adding a diversified real assets fund. Uh, a diversified real assets fund is intended to provide a more diversified approach to inflation sensitivity uh, by allocating to multiple inflation sensitive asset classes. So this could include things like tips, commodities, and REITs. And we think that, you know, this kind of approach to inflation sensitivity um, could potentially be more effective than a more specialized or targeted approach, such as a standalone tips fund or REITs fund or commodity fund. And particularly within a participant-directed plan, offering that more diversified approach just helps participants avoid having to make the complicated decision of allocating between things like tips, commodities, and REITs, which for some participants can be kind of difficult to assess how those different asset classes will respond to inflation at any different point in time. And so it provides that built-in level of diversification. And then I think one other interesting lens with which to think about a potential DRA fund is more specific to the 401A plan where currently uh, there is a standalone TIPS fund. Um, if you were to switch from a TIPS fund to a more traditional diversified real assets fund within the 401A, that would essentially align the approach to inflation sensitivity that the target date funds have and what you could see within the core uh, tier. Uh, so BlackRock within the target date funds, their approach to inflation sensitivity provides access, or provides access to tips, commodities, and REITs. And so by having a more uh, diversified approach through a DRA fund within the core lineup as well, that would essentially give target-date investors and participants who prefer to design their own portfolio allocations a pretty similar mechanism for being able to uh, do just that. So on page 22, um, we also have a similar slide where we look at the potential changes to the 401A plan. We've kind of discussed these in length already, where we are again proposing um, considering a core plus fixed income fund, as well as switching from the more standalone tips fund to a diversified real assets fund. Um, but here I, I'll, I'll pause just to see if there are any questions or, or comments on the alternative structures and some of the changes that we've put forth. Pat, let me add one thing, too, for the investment committee's benefit, which is that the 401A, 10 options are, is the requirement, so that there is this floor on the number of options. Has to be, it has to be 10. We cannot go below that. Okay, Pat, do you want to cover black the target date funds with BlackRock? Yes. Oh, I see a hand up, actually. Bill, does is, is someone have their hand up? Actually, um, I, I don't see a hand up, so go ahead, Patrick. Okay. So if we move to uh, page 26, we've included some slides to provide a review of the um, BlackRock Life Path Index Funds, which we think is important to highlight, given that they are used as the default option. And, and as Tom mentioned up front, a higher level of scrutiny is applied to the default investment option. Um, and so on page 26, we have some information that covers how we at Talon maintain contact and review the target date funds with BlackRock on a periodic basis as well as how the SERS Investment Office engages with the Life Path Index team to make sure that we are both staying on top of what's transpiring um, at BlackRock. 
Uh, we do have a pretty heavy client base that uses the BlackRock Life Path Index Funds. Uh, currently, about 13 of our defined contribution clients do offer the BlackRock target date funds, and together they have roughly $37 billion in target date assets as of June 30th of this year. So we have a lot of client exposure with them. We regularly meet with BlackRock on at least a quarterly basis, if not more frequently if there are client questions. And we are comfortable with the team they have there, with the glide path and process that BlackRock employs, and the performance and long-term track record that the funds have exhibited over time. We do have some slides in here that looked more specifically at performance um, across different vintages. And what we've noted is that compared to peers, the BlackRock funds have done well, and it really um, performed as intended given the construction of the BlackRock glide path. It's really important to consider the performance of the funds with that glide path in mind, um, especially given that BlackRock at the beginning of the glide path for younger investors, they tend to start off with a heavier equity allocation than some peers. Their beginning allocation is roughly 99% equity, 1% fixed income. And so given the uh, relative outperformance of fixed, or excuse me, of equity over longer time horizons, we've seen that farther dated vintages, so think 2065, 2060, 2055, they've tended to do better than some peers, given the outperformance of equity and the higher equity allocation of those vintages. However, given that BlackRock does have a two retirement glide path, um, which means that BlackRock reaches its ending allocation by age 65, they tend to sell off equity and other growth assets a little bit more quickly than other target date providers. And so some of the vintages or funds intended for participants that are nearing or in retirement, they tend to have a slightly lower allocation to equity than the average peer. And as a result, on a raw performance basis or an absolute performance basis, some of those vintages have underperformed over longer time horizons. Again, a lot of that due to the fact that they have slightly lower equity um, compared to some peers. Um, however, you know, we, you know, continue to have confidence in them as a target date manager. Uh, their fees are competitively priced um, compared to peers, and they also have a really effective team in our eyes that's very active in researching their asset class exposures and um, making incremental changes when they view that as valuable. Uh, for instance, earlier this year, they did make a change to the fixed income allocation of their glide path. And what they did was they essentially disaggregated their exposure to the U.S. aggregate index and broke up their fixed income allocation into component pieces, uh, those being long credit, intermediate credit, long government, intermediate government, and securitized. And uh, by making that change, they essentially have additional control to manage credit and duration exposure for participants of different ages. And so that's just one example of a recent change that they've made that was the product of, you know, what we view as an effective uh, research process um, that they follow to make incremental improvements to their target date funds. So I just want to pause here um, to see if there's any questions or comments on BlackRock and their target date funds. Quick question. Quick, quick question. I'm, I was having trouble hearing you, and I just wanted to make certain I understood. And I just want to emphasize how important these um, life path index funds are for our our new employees coming in. Um, this this may be a very important decision for their retirement planning. And I I was interested in hearing you say that BlackRock tends to 
um, invest more in equities for the, the new employees as they're coming in, and as a result, they have a track record of performing better in the overall glide path. But I wasn't quite certain what you were referring to when you said at age 65, BlackRock tends to reduce the investments in equities more so than um, other um, life path kinds of funds? Is that no, that's correct? A great, great question. Um, yeah, I don't think I've Black quite gotten to the question has, yet, but explain that. <laughs> okay. Yes, great question. Um, so, so BlackRock employs, or they follow what we would call a two retirement glide path, which simply means that they aim to achieve their final or terminal allocation at their assumed point of retirement. They assume retirement occurs at age 65, so that when participants reach the BlackRock Fund that aligns with an age 65 participant, they reach their terminal allocation, um, so they no longer continue to be risk. There are other target-based products that continue to be risk past the point of retirement. We would call these kinds of target-based products through retirement wide paths, and given the longer time period over which through retirement glide paths have to be risk and decrease their equity exposure, as a result of that, uh, they tend to have slightly higher equity at the point of retirement, given that it's not the final equity allocation compared to what we see with BlackRock, given that their two retirement glide paths requires them to reach their final allocation at age 65. Does that, does that make uh, sense? Yes. So even though there are these two different long-term models, you're saying that BlackRock seems to ha overall has uh, um, better earnings overall for the... So I would... I would yeah, that's that's a, a good question as well. I would I would say um, I don't know if higher earnings is necessarily how we would characterize it, but I, I think it's the funds have done really well when you consider um, how much equity is in each fund um, compared to what peer funds may have. And so, mm -hmm. for those other data vintages which have that ninety nine percent equity. They've done really well, given how well equity has done, maybe not necessarily as recently, but over more extended time horizons. And even though some of the funds that are intended for participants in retirement haven't returned quite as high as other peer funds have, it makes sense, given that they tend to have slightly lower equity than other peers. Okay. Right. We could go two slides ahead. So if we go up two slides, Pat, and um, for Mary Soderberg's question. So this is showing you the glide path that Patrick is talking about. And if you look at what is in blue, BlackRock growth. So what they're saying to your question about someone going into the 401A, let's say, who's in their early to mid-20s, there, BlackRock is saying you want to have a lot of growth assets because you have a long time horizon before you're going to start to spend this money and you need to build as much of a corpus as you can. So corpus being asset pool. So you want to grow your assets when you're young. You have time to absorb volatility of return. So they're, they're high on the equity at that point. They do drop it down. So if you see by 65, as Patrick's saying, they're at their what we call their terminal point of the equity, uh, the growth, non-growth asset split. And they're saying there that you need to have downside protection around the time someone's retiring. So they're actually doing it even before that because a lot of people don't actually wait until 65 to retire. But at 65, this point where you have more downside protection built in higher fixed income allocation than a lot of peers. So they are trying to 
balance earlier in life, have more equity, grow your assets, you get older, you need more downside protection, more cushion uh, in volatility because you're starting to spend down those assets. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. So in terms of time, we, we have sections on retirement income and ESG. I want to check with Bill or Chair Becker if we should cover that or wrap up at this point. Yeah, I think what's important is, is just to, to cover the TDF, uh, the, the, the new spin on the TDF litigation, and then we can wrap that up. Okay. Thank you. Pat, go ahead. Yes. Um, so within the target date industry, we have – uh, seen some litigation recently, as you're probably well aware. Um, we've seen more than 20 lawsuits come in challenging the plan sponsors' selection and offering of a target date fund suite. Patrick, uh, Patrick this is Bill. If I could interrupt, could you go to slide 27, please? Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. So they, these lawsuits have primarily targeted two targeted families, um, one being the BlackRock Life Path Index Funds. Uh, we've seen 10 lawsuits be filed against plan sponsors for their selection of BlackRock as the target date fund suite. Um, specifically, the lawsuits against BlackRock have alleged that the plan sponsors placed too much emphasis on cost without giving uh, sufficient due to performance. Um, however, we at Kellen did do a pretty deep dive review of these lawsuits. We read through each of them. And what we noted and what other industry sources have noted is that the comparator groups against which the underperformance of BlackRock has been alleged is a very cherry-picked group of other comparators that employ different ways in which they design their target date products. Uh, so several of the lawsuits, the comparator groups that they've looked at include target date providers um, that have different types of glide paths, uh, which goes back to the two versus through uh, discussion that we got into a little bit earlier, as well as target date products that use different management styles, um, whether that's all active management, all passive management, or a blend between the two. And so in our eyes, those comparator groups are very limited. Um, they provide a very stringent lens uh, against which these allegations are made. And so we don't really see there being a whole lot of merits uh, behind not only the groups, but the allegations of underperformance that have been made. And just as recently as last week, last Thursday, in fact, um, a district judge did dismiss two of the 10 lawsuits that were filed. Um, and so that is, I think, a sort of a, a notable development um, that we did see pretty recently. Yeah, and if I can add one aspect that we do recommend, as SERS does, doing regular monitoring of the target date funds. We do that. It's part of the quarterly evaluation that we do with the investment committee. You can see on the prior page that Patrick covered earlier all the monitoring steps that Callan takes and SERS investment office takes. We do the periodic investment structure evaluations like this one we're doing today. We do what we call a target date fund suitability analysis. We recommend doing those every three to five years unless there's a significant change in, for instance, plan design. So we did one last year for SERS, evaluated the suitability of the BlackRock funds at that time. We'll continue to do that in the future. So on the normal cycle, that would be in 2024 in two years. So there's a number of steps being taken on a very regular basis in terms of the the ongoing monitoring uh, that Callan and Sirs IO does, and then these more uh, in-depth review projects. So I I did want to cover that as well because 
you may have the question of what what do we do as fiduciaries and you are doing what you're supposed to do as a fiduciary in terms of the monitoring process as a committee all right thank you patrick uh thank you tom uh unless there are any other questions yeah rebecca let me um uh, take it back and uh, looking down the agenda on uh, number six uh, there are some informational items uh, for you to review uh, we have no special presentations today uh, we do not have a need to break for an executive session so any uh, further questions or comments from the committee uh, if not may I have a motion I'm sorry paradoxical given the robust discussion you just had on inclusion and diversity to exclude the public from commenting. So I've asked this many times for outright to no request, but is it the policy of the board that the public and you're not you don't have a quasi judicial exemption. It's puzzling to me why you don't allow the public on the agenda of the committee or a general meeting. And if you have a legal opinion or policy, please provide it because it's counter to the practices of peace. That's understood, and as you mentioned, you have asked this many times, and, and it's been responded to. And I don't have a formal response. What I'm saying is I'd like the whole board, you just had a discussion on inclusion and diversity, and it, you exclude the public. So if that's your policy, just give me a copy of the policy or a legal opinion. Your response has been no response. All right, we're going to continue with the meeting now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are uh, nothing further from the uh, committee, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. So moved. Thank you. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay, we are adjourned. Uh, the next meeting for the Investment Committee will be February 21st. Good. We'll see you then. Thank you, everyone.